John Carroll, State Board of Education. Thank you for having me, sir. Um, first, I, I, um, I, I want to commend the chair for uh, shuttle diplomacy uh, that uh, got us to a, a middle ground solution that, that I think is part of all. Um, I want to uh, just talk about this word implement that the Secretary has introduced to this discussion. Uh, he spoke about it in his testimony, um, and uh, he, uh, he basically said, and the State Board should have implementation authority over within each of the rule series that it retains. And the Secretary has agreed that the Board will retain special education rules, educational quality standard rules, um, as well as independent school rules. I can't imagine that the Secretary seriously intends that we should have implementation authority over education um, quality rules or special ed rules. But if so, we'd be happy to take all the necessary staff from the agency to do that. So I think we that word is, that. yeah, is, it leaves us, however, though, with another of the Secretary's general principles, which is that confusion and efficiency inherent in the split responsibility that occurs that exists under current law. And I would posit to you that, that the present arrangement where the State Board approves independent schools is a vestige from the long ago days before Act 6098, 2012. Back when the day when the Board was in charge of the department, they hired fired the secretary, the commissioner, if they didn't like how the department was doing something, they could change it. That's not the world we live in. Um, we have no authority over whether the agency does something well or not. And that's appropriate. I'm not trying to litigate that. But I'm just pointing out that the way independent school approvals work, and I didn't bring any with me, but we get them almost every month, is that the agency people go to the schools hold up the rules and say, well, they're doing this, this, and this, you know, and they verify, mm -hmm. uh, they oversee. Um, if there are problems, the agency gets notified. Um, so the school applies for a renewal of its approval every two years, five years, whatever the interval is. That comes to the agency, they receive it, they say, oh, you don't have all the documents you need, so and so support the management of that. There are two people who are largely devoted to this in the agency. Then they go to the school, write up an analysis, present it to the secretary, the secretary studies it, maybe asks questions, and then uh, gives us a summary of their findings and a recommendation. So we basically do what the secretary advises us to do, since we don't have any information that we've gathered ourselves. Uh, so is it your request that we have that be determinative? going forward, in other words, that the secretary, instead of taking the information from his staff that's been gathered, right. making a recommendation, that he just make the decision. Yeah. Okay. The present situation we have now is a divided responsibility. I mean, it's his recommendation. It just, just hypothetically, what happens if a school goes belly up all of a sudden and 40 sets of parents are left holding the bag with tuition that was paid and their kids are not, can't go to school? Who do they get angry at? Well, they ought to get angry under the present law. They ought to get angry at the board because you approved it. And we would turn around and say to the secretary, you told us to approve it. And what good is served by that? Mm -hmm. So I think that's why we originally proposed to remove the board's authority to approve rules, because frankly, we rely entirely upon the agency over whom we have no control. And I might say the board has complained as long as I've been on there with the previous secretary and the present secretary, about the quality of analysis that we see and upon which we are to make our decision. But frankly, we have no ability to improve that quality. So let me restate this. Tell me if I'm... Yep. Uh, so what you're proposing would not change the workload for the agency. Not at all. They, they are... Actually, might simplify because they wouldn't have to ask us to approve it. Right. So with that understanding, Emily, what would the agency's position be on that suggestion? So first I would say that it's the state board's authority now and in our proposed future to set the bar at where it is appropriate to approve or not approve a school's application to, to be an approved independent school. 
And so the main concern that I have is that the agency would be making a decision based on where the state board has set that bar. Some would think it should be lower. Some would think it should be higher. And for each unsatisfied customer our decision creates, we have no ability to respond to their source of disagreement. It would entirely be the state board. And there's no feedback loop there where we would say, sorry, your application is denied. You can take proper appeal procedures, but um, we didn't write the rules, sorry. Uh, the second is that I'm abundantly clear that the state board has been dissatisfied with the documentation that the agency brings to each meeting that they approve independent schools. And um, our response would be that the state board should amend its rules so that we follow a different process and check a different set of criteria that we then bring to them because we just do a a check against the rules that they have. And sometimes we're not satisfied with the result either, but it's the result that the current rules require. So in summary, you oppose this suggestion for those reasons, yes. the agencies. Okay, um, I, in, in my thinking about this and what I've been trying to do, it's to redivvy the, the rulemaking split to redo the charge to the state board, and then otherwise make things mirror reality, and then change that reality as little as possible other than those areas of rulemaking. All the way of saying, so when we talked about <coughs> implementation at the beginning, I think that indicated that we should go along with the board's, uh, I'm sorry, with the uh, Chair Carroll's suggestion, because we don't want to change the implementation split. So here, my tendency is to, if the agency opposes this change, to stay with the way things are currently done, which is um, agency doing the visits, preparing recommendations, handing them to the board. Board. I, I see your point logically. I think the agency has um, logic behind their position too, but in order for this bill to move forward, I think it has to try to try to work as much as possible in areas where there is agreement rather than not agreement. So I would be for um, leaving this situation as it is currently done. In other words, the board retains authority over rulemaking, board sets the bar, and then board has ultimate approval, agency follows the rules set by the board, implements, does the recommending work. Does that make sense, even though it's not where you wanted to go? Oh, well, I understand your logic, um, and, and, and we'll do what you tell us to do. <laughs> I, I, I don't mean to be flip. I, I, I understand. It, 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 it's, it's a logic set that's credible. Yeah. Uh, it leaves behind the sort of uh, confusion about who's actually making this decision and all of that, but I don't need to relitigate that. I, I, I've heard you. And, okay. And I think your other suggestion to anticipate is that we move those rules from session law, not those rules, the rulemaking areas on page 14. Right. Right. Um, it, yeah, it's, it's yes. Can I just ask a question? Have, have you, to your knowledge, the board ever not approved an independent school? If the secretary has said that he or she thinks we have should. sent the agency back to get more information, mm -hmm. um, and we have um, uh, also insisted that the school come and testify before us. Mm -hmm. Uh, we found it fairly frustrating that we don't have access to the agency staff themselves. The, the secretary won't bring them to meetings. We would like to inquire of them what they saw. Uh, so, but I should think that, that if this goes as you suggest, uh, then the secretary and I can talk about how we can make this work more successfully for them and for us. Um, and, I, and I don't disagree with uh, Ms. Simmons' suggestion that the uh, rules could be improved to clarify what the board is so preoccupied about. And in, in fairness, it, it, what comes up a lot is the board is very concerned about governance. Mm -hmm. You know, who's on that board and what do they know? And second, uh, financial management and oversight. 
And the, although the rules speak to that, they don't speak as forcefully as I think we've come to understand. Those are very important. And so I think we can make this work better um, within the constraints of what, you're, uh, what you suggest. Um, um, if I may, to go, go to, the, uh, to the question on, on page, uh, uh, it's actually page 13 and 14, uh, starting at line 13 on page, line 14 on page 13. Um, uh, all of that is going to be in session law as it's now proposed and drafted. And yet the language in paragraph A at the bottom of page 13 is, is really important language. This sort of sets the ground rules about, which basically says, if it's not called out to be the, the boards, it's the agencies. Yeah. Well, burying that in session law seems to me just to be an invitation for years and years of equivalent. And is this stuff important? Yeah, you can see that it's important. We spent three weeks arguing about it. So um, it would just seem to me to make a lot of sense to have um, this language up in either chapter three, which is the, the, uh, the what the board's authorities are, or chapter five, which Jim pointed out the place where he would. Right. It would be in both places, though. Yeah. Okay. And we need yeah. to deal with section one and two, because we're going to sign all the rules. Yeah. But we're going to have the authority. We're going to put the list as well of the city board's duties and powers. So, Jim, do you mean then what's on 13 and 14? What's on together? 14. That rule set there. Um, not by the, that, that set of responsibilities for rules uh, would be on page. Wait. Three, yeah. Um, seven. So the powers and duties would, would include rulemaking in those areas, and then right. And then what about the uh, on page thirteen, section fourteen, or is is that one whole section? That's one section. The A part, <coughs> yeah. The, the A part presumably would go either in the board or in the secretary's uh, duties and authorities. Yeah, which is. Chapter five. Well, I'll, I'll leave it to Jim yeah. where it fits best. Yeah. But so the idea would be that both that paragraph A on the section fourteen and the list would go in. Yeah. I don't quite know how to work in A actually into the statute. Okay. So um, it could possibly go um, in connection with two twelve on page six, where yeah. you talk about secretary's duty generally, and that's where you get into talking about rulemaking. Authority of the secretary, and it might might be there. Anyway, I think, Emily has to yeah. I think that the language that the secretary proposed accomplishes this better. Mm -hmm. um, we would have had the language say adopt rules pursuant to the, re the relevant provision as necessary for the implementation of powers given to the board under this section, which is where its authorities are listed, and then the other various sections that correspond to the existing rule series. Where, where is the language you're, you're on the document from our meeting, but Jim changed that language in today's draft. Okay. So as I mentioned, that cross-reference is a bunch of sections of law, mm -hmm. which is fine today. If you, if you get final sections of law, you cross-reference them. But in two years, when you add more, more duties and powers for rulemaking, in another section, are you to remember to put it back on that list? Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm just worried about, yeah. so yeah. I'm fine with having this proposal here, that makes sense to me to put that the list in there, uh, putting that limit to this list. Cross reference is sections of statute here. Right yeah. yeah. I don't understand how Jim's idea is different than mine, because you'll still have to update the list there anytime a new area of authority is given to the state board. Except mm -hmm. my concern of putting the name of the current, current rule series is it ties their hands. What you're actually giving them is rulemaking authority where there's a jumping off point in the statute that you've decided is the state boards, rather than, I don't think you mean to give them rulemaking authority on a series of rules called special education, but nothing else that might be related in the statutes. Well, I wouldn't be missing the rule series in the powers and duties, but this in the content of the rules. I mean, at any time that the General Assembly determines that we should have some additional rulemaking authority, it's yeah. You can do 
Yeah. 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 Don't see that that's a complication. Okay, so um, it seems to me that's that's a uh, matter for the lawyers to, to figure Can out. I, say it with, yeah. I don't agree to the language on page three as it stands today because that's identical to the secretary's rulemaking prompt, and I um, I don't think it's consistent with our agreement. We said which, the state board. Which language on that? <coughs> Page three of the draft you're looking at today, lines seven through five. Seven through five? Oh, sorry, one through five. One through five, okay. Um, so that's very, that's open-ended. We did incorporate your suggestions there. No, no. no. They, 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 well, part, yeah. They lose their suggestions, but yeah. they also have one to put in cross-references to sections of law that currently give the state board rulemaking authority, which is not in this section of the duties. So, so basically, cross reference a bunch of statutes, and as I say, I'm worried about doing that because I see. So, so I was not going to list out the rule series here. I was going to list out the, the, the state board had authority over making rules for independent schools, for the content areas. So I was going to list out the content areas for you. No map to your rules. Um, so that's, that was the first I would recommend. So, Emily, can you just, um, I don't have your language in front of me, so it's a little I can hard. pass you my page. I just no, showed it to Senator Hardy. Um, so, so you want to add for the implementation of powers given to the board under this section and under sections, dot, 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 dot. And if it makes, if it works better for you, Jen, maybe under, um, we could make it refer to topics rather than sections of law, but would that be in language for the implementation of the authority given yeah, to it? Yeah, topics, topics are better, because we're going to have topics that are ready for So to make rules sure. about special education, independent social Educational quality schools. Book her out. Do you understand? Book her out. Okay, so I will put page three, also as an outstanding question. And am I assuming on pages 13 and 14, Emily, um, you, or uh, we, we bumped off of that one. What was the decision on paragraph A under section 14 of which lawyer are you asking? Well, I'm, I'm wondering, Jim seemed to think that was tough to this, find a place. This is why it's actual law. This is why it's meant, not meant to be a statute. It doesn't need to be. B, B is fine for a statute. A is basically saying, you re, re, you know, at, at one time deal, you're reordering who's responsible for rules. It's so like a one time realignment. So, John? Yeah. Agnostic. Okay. So let's go with leaving um, paragraph A in session law and moving the, the piece on yep. 14 okay. to statute. It will be in both places. Yes. Okay. Um, I want to come back if we could to the conversation we had about approving independent schools because it's not just that. Um, Emily, I'm sure you hear this. So, so if we have the, the independent schools are still approved by the board, does it also apply to post-secondary schools? Does it also apply to distance learning schools? There are other categories under the 2200 series that I'm not sure what you want to do, so. Um, I guess if we're gonna leave um, how we handle, I hate this word implement. Yeah. Uh, how we handle uh, independent school rules, um, Status quo, Conte, then I think we ought to do that for the entire Rule 2200. Okay. Rather than try to rejigger out yes. how we do this. And, uh, for now, anyway, I'm certainly not prepared to, to parse that baby uh, into you do this, you do that. Let's just leave the whole thing the way it is. Yeah. Uh, and then we can, if we see a better solution at some other time, we can talk about that. Fair enough. Another question, one more question. Yeah. Sorry, this is detailed stuff I know, but yeah. um, so for independent schools, for example, um, there's a decision whether to approve the score or not, which you will have. 
there's a bunch of other language about various steps are taken in the process to get information about the schools or to set fees for application fees. Is that going to be with, and it's done by the ACA. Is that going to be with the agency or the state board? I, I think for now we ought to just leave the rule as it stands. Okay. And, and, and come back and, and examine this. Yeah. And, and a really important piece is the is the review piece that you, I, I don't know where that came up. Was, was it 173 or, mm, or 49? Yeah. It was in, um, I forget what bill it was. Or maybe the big bill. Was it? Where was it? It was in Act 173. Uh, there you go. Anyway, that review process, we've activated that once already mm -hmm. with respect to the Compass School in Westminster. and. Um, the, the the result was really really positive. And you you like retaining yeah the board's uh, power to do yeah. And e even if the approval was the secretary's, I would welcome the opportunity to keep doing that. But yeah. anyway, so that all stays unchanged okay. uh, because it's it's all in the independent school rule yeah. approval stuff, and we just leave that all alone. Well, I'll take one more example. Uh, we've been dealing a lot with the uh, what happens is to. Um, uh, transcripts when schools go out of business. Mm -hmm. Right now, the statute has the state board doing lots of things about that process, about you know, determining what happens next, or doing appeals to the, the court system, or making sure that there's a good record retention plan. I think we changed that, didn't we? No. Oh, well, sorry. We changed it, but that's my question. It was an independent school approval, or, or do it, do it, do it, do it, the post-secretary school approval or now disapproval, which if we go by that philosophy, you'd be doing that still. So this yeah, but, but this philosophy that every rule that the board has authority over, it must have author implementation authority, is, is would you start with frankly, yeah. would you start with I, I don't know. So let's, instead of dealing with the philosophy, let's just, is there agreement on the way the draft is now, it, um, who, who has that responsibility? Right now, uh, right now, it's gone back to the state board has responsibility under the foster that we had, I thought we had a couple of days ago, and as of here now. And existing, existing, existing yeah. statute with regard to independent schools and, and, and anything else covered by rule um, 2200. Yes. Or secondary, this is would remain board. unchanged. Yes. And so that post-secondary transcript issue is a special case, truly, because the agency and the state board actually agreed last year in the context of last year's miscellaneous education bill to change didn't, that responsibility to the secretary. Pass, right? And it didn't pass. So throughout this year, I think the state board has approved four agreements yes, for closing um, post-secondary institutions that are closing. and. It doesn't take much time off of their agendas, no, but if they would like, right, right, if they would like for that approval to only be within the AOE, that's totally appropriate. I see that as a consumer protection provision, and it's not related to approval of an institution to open up. It, it's it's in the it's in the it's a classic case of the kind of thing where we don't bring much value and expertise mm -hmm. and and um, we come and we go but the agency is always there so if there's a way easily to move that that's great um, but it, it's a little bit like uh, changing school snow day rules I mean this it, it, stuff from the old days that, mm -hmm. that I think we all would like to see changed so if it could be done easily great if not we'll just Okay, so you're both in agreement if it can be done easily. Yeah. We would support it. Okay. <laughs> I have, I just, I made that. I, I, I think we've covered most of it. I want to just point out what I think is a possible conflict of purpose or something. On page six lines 13, 14, 15, something like that. Uh, Shall adopt, uh, uh, shall adopt rules, the secretary shall adopt rules, um, uh, of, uh, of all persons under the secretary's supervision and control as directed by the General Assembly. So to the extent that the board retains rules over educational quality standards, over special education, uh, those 
involve people who are under the authority of the secretary. I see. And so that seems to me to be an invitation for a later disagreement mm -hmm. uh, where the agency says, well, we have authority over all rules that uh, pertain to people over whom we have oversight. And uh, well, that simply undoes the agreement that we yeah. have made about education quality standards and all that. So that, that language just reaches way too broadly into what, the area of, of what authority. If, and this isn't our language. This is language from the original draft. And I thought that it was odd, too. So I went and looked. And it's the rulemaking prompt used for most state agencies okay. who all have rulemaking right. authority. Right. Right. And um, I think the essence of our agreement is that the state board will have the rules that you all and we have agreed are important for them to retain. And other rules will be the agency of education's <coughs> rules, unless you specifically mm -hmm. dictate otherwise. Yes. That's why I think that this language is appropriate in concert with what we discussed earlier, which is a very clear list of what belongs to the state board. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but the language that says all rules will be, um, will the, be the secretaries except um, a list is not going to be in statute, it's going to be in session law. And I, I just feel like if that, that is a, it would seem that they ought to both be in statute. Um, this, it seems to me, just invites confusion. It's, uh, uh, Can I, well, this will be in, in statute but, and discussion. But uh, paragraph A that sets uh, for the rules about that, except for the State Board of Education rules and so on, that will not be in statute as, as you have advocated. Yeah. But it's just last out, but they still law, so it's not going to go away. But uh, I, I see John's point, which is um, a broad reading of this charge on the Secretary's duties would indicate that um, the Secretary controls all rules pursuant to anybody in the employ of AOE. The weird duty split that we've been dealing with from day one is that the State Board does, in fact, have the power under rulemaking to direct the agency to do certain things. So um, let's throw in a reference to Section 164, except as provided in Section 164, which is where the State Board's rulemaking authority will be. Nice. Yeah, I, I would just point out that this language of uh, execution of its powers and duties and of the, of the powers and duties of all persons under its supervision and control has been around for years. It used to apply to the state board. We struck it out yeah. because there are no persons under the state board's supervision and control. <laughs> we, we are very mindful of that. This is referring to AOE. This, yeah, this is referring to AOE. Yeah. I understand that, but the original language was yeah. here. Yeah. Uh, it, so what do you think about Emily's suggestion to make reference to uh, acceptance directed in Section 160? Uh, I think that's a good suggestion. Well, too many lawyers in the room. I'm, there, not, I'm not a lawyer. That's your appropriate execution of the power and duties in our duties of the agency. I'm not sure why okay. that went into your story. Well, she's. All right, well, well, let's belt and suspenders it by yes. referencing back, except right, as. Right, right. In, in other words, it, it might offend your. Redundancy of that meter, Jim, but it it uh, speaks to an anxiety. Okay. Can I, in conclusion, please um, just celebrate what you're doing here? Because, in addition to your observation that we have stipulated that any rulemaking by this board will be within the limitations of legislative intent about which you know I'm pretty ferocious. We also, uh, you, uh, have done something really important by striking out on page one at 164 in the general powers and duties, the language that was slipped into law at Act 98, where it says at line 16, and establish and advance education policy for the state of Vermont. That never existed in state law until Act 98. 
which of course did strip the board of virtually all of its authorities. And this was tucked back in, uh, not in the original draft. But by I others. remember the morning it was you tucked back Okay, you were there, president of the creation, I was not. I, I was I, I was on the other side, yeah. but I, I, Bill Doyle was sitting in that chair right there, uh, and I had a 3-2 three, three, majority for, for not making the change yeah. to, a, to an agency, and then, um, so Bill talked to somebody else. A, an old hand in the building who shall not be named <laughs> came in, met with Bill Doyle, and he switched. And this was part of the uh, part of the. Uh, when I was majority leader, we had a 16 to 14 majority, and I, I suffered with the same yeah. phenomenon. Yeah. Anyhow, so taking that um, taking that language out is a huge step uh, because it has been understood by uh, previous boards. Uh, to mean that we make law. The, the established policy has been understood to, to right. effect. And I think getting that out of there is a huge step. So, well, as, I, I, as I've said, if nothing else happens, if those two things happen, success. Yeah. Again, I want to um, thank you, um, Mr. Chair, for coming to us with this. I mean, the health care bargaining bill happened similarly. There was uh, the governor was proposing statewide health care bargaining. NEA was opposing it. The following year, they came forward with their own draft, which allowed the, you know, the log jam to be cleared. Same here. You you came forward, um, in essence, uh, willing to, to circumscribe the powers of your own body, and that's the only thing that's allowed this to go forward. So. Very much appreciated. I thank you, especially you, Mr. Chair, but also the committee in charge. Thank yeah. you, and Jim. Emily, would you like to take a minute, sir, or have we answered your thoughts? Um, I think I'm good, but may I have time to review the very long draft and all Absolutely. of its details since you So just, just to clarify, and I, I have yet to ask for questions from the committee to either, but the idea is to treat this now as a an extremely semi-final draft, but tomorrow we'll come in with the intention of final markup and vote. Doesn't look like there'll be much in the way of markup. So unless one of the parties or uh, one of the major educational organizations come forward with an objection, we probably will vote this out pretty quickly tomorrow. But but understood that you would like to review it and reserve the right to um, put it for. More alteration. I was just going to say, there's that one funky line that yeah. we didn't know what it did. You were you in the room when you were, when we were talking mm -hmm. about no, that? I found it on the next page, too. So it made me feel better that it appeared twice. <laughs> <laughs> Two funky lines. I support what Jim has done, which is to keep both entities in and leave it do no harm because we don't know where it came from. It's really yeah. I'm just worried about this is a big bill. I'm worried about mine, Mrs. Mayor, frankly. I want to take a lot to return this draft. That's easy. But I was wondering if you want to give people more review time to go through it. Um, you mean let it hold over during crossover? Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Um, Wait, during crossover? You mean during our break? During our break. Yeah, okay. You want it out by crossover. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. So um, I'm, I'm fine with that. So. Why don't we think about tomorrow as when we um, get it ready from the committee's perspective. So, committee, let's yeah. go to 226. Okay. I had a couple of questions on this. Okay. On the list, yeah, I just wanted to know about the only questions I have with special ed. So on these two, the way it's going, it didn't show up. The way it would work is the two. So on that, what's the question? Or why was that the go to AOE because of the federal rules regulation? Right. So, so they agree based on the logic that this is um, actually seventy-three and I implemented now. So my feeling was let's not interrupt what's going on because there was all, already a lot of contention around the special education advisory panel and the new rules that AOE drafted and then the state board 
to step in because they have the final authority to, to mediate between them. So that seemed to me a good, a good outcome. And so I recommended to the secretary that we need special education where it is with the idea that possibly in the future we would contemplate moving those off. Mostly because of Act 173. So that was agreed to by AOE and Chair Care. But no future date set. No, in other words, just we'd have to come back to it and address this way. Yeah. Post post 173 and yeah. four years, five years. 2022. That was the year I was advocating for. <laughs> so, <delay> <laughs> we don't have Jim. What happened to Jim? I just got. You just got what? I just got a document from him. So. Oh, he must have just hit send, and now it will come out. Okay, so Jeff, Colin, Sue, I'm I'm <clears throat> thinking yesterday we, as we ended, we kind of had in place what seemed like the committee's straw-voted version. We had a couple of outstanding questions. So one of those outstanding questions was superintendents. I talked earlier with Sue, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, Sue, but Sue says that school boards are OK with just pulling out superintendents, not business managers or AR or HR. Jeff? We agree with that. Okay. We, Sue and I met with Colin this morning. I, I have one concern still. I raised it last week, but I want to reiterate it in the language I didn't see it get fixed. It's part of the, the pay. If we pay by income, I still want to make sure that that's not reversing any actions we took a couple years ago where school districts would pay 80% of health care costs. We expected kind of at least 20 out of the employees. Okay. So. Different issue. Right. Let, let me come to that in but just one, yeah. one sec. So, um, so the idea would be to have, to, in fact, Jim, in his new draft, is that what he just sent you, Jeannie? Yes, he's bringing copies. Okay, great. So in that draft, he has pulled out superintendents because that looked like where we were going. So that basically solved. Um, I think we have the draft 5.1. I have four I think there's a five point one. You think it's beyond five point one? Yeah, I think there's a oh, okay. Oh, we'll, we'll wait it's five point two. Okay. Five point two. Um I think that's good. I'm happy with just pulling them out. And yeah. I did get a text from Jeff, the yeah, other Jeff okay that, that he was good with that. Yeah. Yep. Okay. <laughs> I had an error in my draft, which Jeff Yen corrected for me. So here is the updated draft. And Jeannie, I hope you'll make more copies for folks. And you want to let us, let us know what's different here, Jim, and then, yeah. then we'll ask um, our folks what they think. So this is draft uh, uh, director Jim David as council draft 5.2 of S226. So first change is at page one. So uh, the definition of school employee now says it includes the following individuals, same list as before. And then on page two, it says uh, line four. Uh, now standing, it's the Division A. It excludes individuals who serve in the role of superintendent. Great. Okay. Elegant. Um, then, next change is up on page six. Um, just cleaning up the appropriation. They got the brackets around the dollar figure, uh, bringing a general fund. And this is what I, I uh, had made a mistake about to so other people in this, who don't have this draft. Um, the line 2021 20, uh, has been struck out. And, and the draft that I had distributed earlier, I just deleted this language altogether without striking it. So that's okay. That's a change I just thought to write down. Likewise, on page 7, uh, lines 11 through 13, this has been struck out. Mm -hmm. okay. 
And then uh, on top of page eight, uh, it says the commission may negotiate a statewide business procedure for disputes concerning public school employee health benefits. Mm -hmm. Then we have this language that has not been settled on yet, uh, on eight through <coughs> 14. Okay, um, and, and uh, I, I spoke earlier with Sue about this, and we'll, we'll hear from them. I think it's mostly around the timing of, uh, of November 1st. And then we go over to page 11, and uh, I took the word comprehensive, so it says uh, on line 11, uh, including a cost estimate for the term of proposal. Mm -hmm. And that is it. on page 12, line 9. It now says explaining in appropriate detail the rationale for selecting the last yeah. best offer. Yes, yeah, so we should have the entire language there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. So, with, thank you, Jim. With that said, um, Jeff and Sue, I'm not sure if you'd like to come to the table or where, where you are in terms of wanting to comment on this. Uh, I, Jeff, and for the record, uh, we met and we talked about data, which is found on the issues are found on page eight yeah. of draft 2.5.2. Uh, I think we're still we're mostly there, but I think we just had one or two I, questions. I think when I spoke with Sue before, I suggested moving um, on or before October 1st and then leaving February 1st for when they could supply it. And it seemed like Sue might be okay. So, uh, Sue Sikolowski, Vermont School Board Association. We actually really favor um, Senator Hardy's suggestion, which was to um, require timely submission, but not to have dates in there. Mm -hmm. um, but if you you are going to have dates in there, um, I think October first would be better than November first. My my. Uh, Ordinarily, I'm a fan of fuzzing up <laughs> because if you get more agreement. My my feeling, though, is if you know there was a dispute about getting information because the two sides disagreed on the need for it and on what was timely. So I think if we just say timely, we leave it to both sides and even to individual districts to determine what timely is. So I, I think in this case, if we supply a, a date that's agreeable, um, I think that's preferable to having it hang out there just as a determination to be made by the parties on the clock what time it is. Um, so I heard the last thing you said was if we were going to do a day, we'd prefer October 1st. Yes. Okay. So committee, how do you feel about Doing a date, not. Yeah, I agree with you. October 1st is good. Yeah. Ruth? It's fine with me. Okay, let's go with October 1st on line 9 and leave February 1st on line 12. Um, Sue, are there things you want to speak to? Or? I think you covered the um, exclusion of superintendents. Yes. Right. So, yeah, we, the SBA um, supports that. I was not able to get um, feedback from the employer commissioners on that okay. particular topic. Okay. Jeff, anything else? No, I think we're, we're supportive of 5.2. Okay. And would the you October one. your position now on the bill as supportive, neutral, or in opposition? <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess I would say mostly supportive. Okay. And understood that there, that for each side, I think there was a piece that they didn't necessarily want. Right. Okay. Very good. So, um, Jim, that's a pretty minimal chance. Can everybody now? Want to do that? And then we'll. Uh, Wait, oh, yeah. sorry. Yeah. So my question, and it's kind of to the cross out, the premium responsibility percentage that's page six down at the bottom. <laughs> and I understand that, and I don't necessarily have a problem if they want to negotiate different premium percentages for different employees. 
but as my understanding, a couple years ago when we made the deal, you know, it was like an 80-20 split. Well, we didn't really, I don't think we specified any, any split right. numbers. But I guess what I'm trying to say is... Um, you don't want the district on the hook for more. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I... You know what I mean? I don't want to see the high-end employee, you know, the employee who's making a lot to pay, you know, roughly the 20, but negotiate the 10, I'd rather see them work that out within their membership, how they want to do it. I don't think that's, mm -hmm. that's a lot of negotiating for individual school boards and the complexity of these plans it makes it more complex, the more variance we put in it. Well, at issue is, you know, in, in the bargaining itself, between employer and employee is the, the split. So it would be hard, I think, to limit it because then we'd basically just be determining by statute, which is what the governor wanted to do originally. He um, had an estimate of $14 million could be saved, and then he wanted in statute the results of the bargaining, which the legislature didn't go along with. Um, so I, I see what you're saying, but it seems to me the only way we could do that would be by predetermining an outcome of the bargaining. I mean, just to me, I mean, that's... I just still have an uneasiness because it's still. Mm -hmm. Do you want to have a separate vote on this piece? I don't think like it matters. I'm not someone who thinks that committee votes end up anywhere anyway. Okay. Um, I, but it still I, makes me new to one. I just. Yeah. I, I just worry about the long term implications can be. I, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, either side or anybody else in the room. But I think what we're talking about is um, NEA wants the ability to have a, to bargain and to seek agreement on different rates of contribution. Mm -hmm. I would think that wouldn't change the basic dynamic of <coughs> how much the employers are willing. Really well, I don't see the NEA going to the members saying, yeah, you're going to have to go up to 25% contribution because we're going to give new teachers out of college, they're only going to have to pay 10% or 5% of their income. Well, I, I, I do think if you're negotiating different rates of contributions, that that would be something you'd have to be honest with your members about, that it may mean that people at higher income levels pay more, right? So um, I, I, I wouldn't assume at all that it means that the difference would come out of the hides of the districts. Because again, that'll be openly bargained. Um, the premise behind this draft is that you've got the, the employers on one side want a statewide grievance procedure. They're now able to bargain that, and NEA would be able to bargain for differential contributions. If I'm the school boards, there's no way I, I, would, I would let the fact that they're going to have differential rates of contribution force me to accept a result that I don't want otherwise. So it seems like you're still getting the same bargaining dynamic. It's just that they have the ability to seek a split within their own. Right, which is, I have no problem with that, but I, I wish there was a way we could legislate that. It's like, yeah, I, I think it would, the only way that I can see to do it would be to put in a solution. That. Which I wouldn't be opposed to, but I, I, I get some folks. I think so, others of us would be opposed to that. So, just checking. So, if you want, we can have. If we did originally straw vote this. Yeah. So, if we don't change it, do you want to have a, another? Uh, okay. All right, Jim. Then, if you can get us another draft and smoke them, if you got them, five minutes. <laughs> Are you going to do proficiency based grading next or not? Uh, I could wave off those books before they give up, get on the bus. If Jim has a draft for. Oh, she what? already got on the bus, never mind. Oh. Oh. <laughs> They're coming. Hold up. Also, is people waiting coming up or? Not sure. Um, it'll depend on whether Jim has a, uh, actually he does have a job. He does have a job. Yeah, it's <clears throat> Yeah, 1.1. So yes, we will discuss this. 
So Jim, you want to um, yeah. show us what we got? Yeah. So um, just two sections. Uh, first section, uh, session law. Um, this is on line nine. On before December 15, 2020, the AC of Education, in collaboration with the State Board of Education, to have an AM bracket in case you want more stakeholders involved in this. So, I study recommend and report to the House and Senate uh, Committees on Education on how to implement simulation B1, uh, the Keep Away Factors Report, Commission under um, Act uh, 173. Including the timeline for implementing the correct people we changes, how to implement these changes in a manner that is sensitive to the effect on property tax rates and school budgets, and three, the interaction of these changes with other provisions of existing law. And this list is from Chloe, Chloe Wexler, I have a list of things here, including the excess spending penalty threshold, the whole harmless provision, the effect on non operating districts. Uh, in the districts to which they pay tuition, small school grants, and incentives to pay under under Act 46. Um, and then B, as part of this collaboration with the Agency of Education under Subsection A, uh, on before December 1, 2020, the State Board of Education shall hold not less than five public meetings in different regions of the state to gather input on the waiting report and its implementation. If you could add a sentence there, Jim, that makes it clear that they would then pass those findings to AOE for inclusion in their implementation plan. I can do it, but it says it's part of the collaboration with them, so I can okay. assume, but if you want me to add it, I can. Um, well, it, it doesn't specify that they have to okay. pass on their work product. So. Um, I'm also wondering about the language shall study, recommend, and report um, on how to implement. Could we just say more directly um, they shall develop a, uh, an implementation plan? Yeah, let's Because I think it's, the rest is implied, and I, I'd like to yeah, avoid. No right. No study ever. Right, exactly. Yeah. Does that make sense, Jim? Yeah. Other comments on this? Um, uh, either the approach or the language? The approach is the approach. I, I don't know if I can support it just because I, I don't know if I support the move to the oh, to that change in that. Good, so good point. So can we have a piece explicitly, Jim, that says the legislature will then um, deliberate and uh, either accept or not accept the, the Implementation plan. Sure. I don't know. That's not the most helpful way of saying that, but making it clear that there's a uh, that the legislature has to green light. Okay. Making it clear that it has to green light. No. That In order for it to go forward. Oh. It would have to green light. Okay. In other words, it won't automatically go into it. Um. Okay. Oh, can we? Oh, we can't do it like. We, we could. Cannot. We could, but stop it, but we, but we don't have to agree with you. You mean, um, well, that's always the case. Like, if we if we passed this year that it was going to go into effect, we could stop it regardless next session. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Um, as long as we did it before it was implemented. It can go into effect for that statutory changes anyway. So yeah. And, and I'm, it's more a psychological thing, mm -hmm. because when people read it, like Corey, they're, they're going to say, I want to be doubly sure that we're going to have to have a vote on this next year um, once we see the implementation plan. Mm -hmm. So the idea is to make it clear that we're not studying it. It's a plan for implementation. And then there'll be uh, essentially a up or down vote on it after it comes out of the committee of jurisdiction. It, assuming it comes out of the committee of jurisdiction. Um, so I, I, I'm happy that we're, we've moved to this sort of interim step because yeah. there's a lot of stuff that needs to be worked out. I guess my concerns with looking at this, and um, this is no disrespect to anybody involved with these two entities, but I'm concerned about putting this fully in the hands of the State Board of Education and the Secretary of Education and this Agency of Education because I think that there is 
a lack of confidence in those two organizations out in the field. And um, I'm concerned with the sort of blowback that might happen with a major change like this, unless there are more sort of partners at the table that will help determine how to implement it. Um, and talking to my school districts, um, you know, wanting to have superintendents at the table, spe special ed directors potentially, um, to make school boards association. I think legislators need to be involved because we're going to have to put it through this building. And unless there are people who can really speak in detail about what mm -hmm. this does, we're not. We're going to have a hard time passing major legislation through here. So I guess I I I like this potential approach. I just feel like it needs to be broader. And yes, obviously we can all go to the meetings and yeah. you know, sit and watch and participate as we can. But I think without a real structure about getting the sort of <coughs> major players involved, it might be more difficult. Um, I'm also, you know, there are a lot of policy questions that have to be answered in order to implement something like this. And I, I'm not, I mean, the implementation plan may speak to those policy decisions, but I think they are decisions that we have to make in terms of what are we going to do with all of these and to elements. Be, to be clear, the implementation plan when it comes to us is just language. So we would then, so January 1st of next year under this uh, rubric, that language would come to committee. We would apply all of our policy scrutiny at that point, mm -hmm. and then we would uh, only green light out of the committee what we were comfortable with. To go back to the, the idea of the, the different constituencies, the superintendents, the special ed folks or whatever, I, so this is avoiding a study committee, which is where you would specify those people to together create a kind of agreed upon implementation. <laughs> so this is specifically going to the governmental agency that does this and, and asking them to put forward the plan, they will draw on advice from all those areas um, as a matter of course. But speaking for myself, I would be reluctant to, in this, name a bunch of people and elevate them to the point where the agency is going to have to dicker with each of them about how it's going to implement. So, that's a difference of approach. What you're describing sounds more to me like a study committee as we really understand it, where you have Dan French or designee as one member, you know, all these other people as single members. What we would wind up then, I think, would be a bunch of homogenized recommendations that then we would ultimately do our policy work on and ask the agency to implement anyway. So, so I'm, I'm trying to go over that step, but it wouldn't eliminate the advice that those people would offer the agency and the state board going forward. Um, I kind of see what you're saying about the skepticism around those organizations within the state, but I, I you know, I don't think this is uh, a huge um, lift in terms of coming up with an implementation plan given the study's results. It's, it's mostly education and phasing and is there a way to ameliorate the effects on hardest hit communities? Well, there are a whole bunch of things that are not answered in the study in terms of decisions to be made. I mean, about the spending threshold, for example, that's major. They were they removed the spending threshold in the simulations. So you know, trying to figure out what 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 is the appropriate that's a policy decision. So what is the state? What is the agency of education going to do? Are you expecting them to make a recommendation of this is where the 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 spending threshold should be? Is that what you're yeah. saying? Yeah, and I mean, Chloe in producing her simulations remove the excess spending. Yeah. So it's, you know, it's a policy decision, but what they would do is they would put forward a, a plan that probably 
stipulated that, and then that's their approach. It comes to this committee, and then they explain their assumptions that their approach is based on. If we disagree with them, we might do something else with the excess spending. And so in other words, this isn't going to produce anything that's acted upon except by this committee, or the, you know, the House committee will get a copy, too. Mm -hmm. um, and then we will begin our work on it. But we would be beginning from an actual plan of implementation, and we would be uh, sort of the beneficiaries of this public education tool that the state board would have already conducted. Five public meetings. Um, I'm also, I don't think we ever had a discussion about our feeling as to whether or not simulation B1 was. Well, that's the, the discussion we're having now. Yeah, because I, I know that's the yeah. one that you asked for the updated, yeah. and, and you know may, maybe that is the, the quote unquote best one, but I don't think we as a committee ever discussed if that's the one yeah. we think, and that's a huge decision in and of itself, and, um, in terms of the approach that we want them to implement. Mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't really say what it is in here. Simulation B one for people who've never read the report, they're not going to know what that means. Yeah. Um, and the other thing I would add on this list of things, um, the, the study does mention um, early, early college and whether or not to have a wait for early college. And a couple of my superintendents have requested that we consider that. And so I don't know if it's possible to add that to this list of the other things um, to include. Um, Do you mean early college or early ed? Early college, because right now, if students go to early college, they're not included in the pupil counts for a school right. district. And so school districts are still, in most cases, providing educational services to those students, but they're not getting counted. Yeah, I, I think the, the level of complexity that would introduce for the number of people involved in the early college program um, makes it, you know, sort of complexity prohibited, I, I would think. In other words, um, in the simulations, there's the suggestion that we could add in special ed. There's the suggestion that we could add in and take care of small school grants, and then early college. So there are all kinds of ways in the report, if you wanted to, you could make the weighting formula speak to seven or eight different <coughs> needs, but with each category that you add, especially ones that aren't currently part of the formula, you're increasing the level of complexity. And I, I can't see that there's enough benefit for the, the relatively small number of students that do early college. Um, but that's my, my opinion. So, so it's a, a point well taken. We, we haven't had a discussion about which simulation to use. I asked Jim to plug in B1 because it's the um, it's the least bells and whistles, um, and special ed is not really a one-to-one -one correspondence with special ed. It's a kind of way of predicting special ed, and the census-based formula that we've already got going into place with 173 seems to me a much more accurate marker because it's based on their actual data. So that's why I didn't want to use the special ed one. Um, and the small school grant, again, there's only four or five communities that are getting it now that aren't getting it as a merger support grant. So it doesn't seem like there's a huge need to change the weighting formula in terms of that. So that's why I went with B1. But let's leave that open as to which simulation we use. Um, how do others feel about Ruth's other um, thought about more, more organizations at the table? This, this imagines the agency in a kind of stripped down fashion, creating an implementation and avoiding uh, a study committee to follow the so, study we just had. So we've asked the agency to implement Act 46 and proficiency-based learning and same state board. And I don't think either one of them got rave reviews from our constituents. 
and this one's going to be a large tax on increase in a lot of towns. Um, so I think you're going to have more fodder for someone like me to come down next year and say, just get rid of the board again, if you can. <laughs> and there, well, <laughs> there, sure. to be clear, what, what the board is doing here is essentially a listening tour with a basic explanation of what, right. what is it. But what happens when we go to the community and the community says, hey, our tax is going to $0.52, cents. we're dead set against this. And they, they still were, do it. They're well, still gonna, then they're no, gonna, no, still going to no. holler and say we weren't listened to. No, no. The board. Well, the board passes that yeah. testimony on to the agency, and the agency theoretically uses it to fine tune their implementation. Um, with <coughs> that said, if you implement this waiting formula, there are going to be communities that are outraged. Uh, there's no way around it because historically we've underfunded certain communities, which means that. Those communities are now enjoying an advantage that I don't think we've ever funded anybody, but that's a different Well, I mean, we, we are getting letters now that are talking about reparations for communities that have been underfunded historically. So this is going to ferment the way that, you know, these other controversial bills sort of bubble along, and we will develop people who will probably um, you know, become more outspoken, more involved in the electoral process based around that we didn't do something or that we did do something. So, Jim, thought? I think this is a little premature to do this okay. so soon with everything else in the works. Premature to, because this puts it out a year for the agency to come back with a plan. Right. Do you think there's that still there's still things in the works that need to be worked out back home with the school boards, superintendents, parents, taxpayers. This is just going to look like there's they're going to get we're going to get jump them again on a mm -hmm. on a increase in taxes. I mean, I think that definitely some communities would really appreciate something like this sooner than later. I think there's so much going on right now, they can't digest what's given to them. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. I mean, there are there are going to be people, and, and it won't be a few, a, a, a sizable group in the state will feel like it's never the right time to do this because it will mean a, a rise in their taxes that they're just never going to be ready for. Um, then there are, there is a larger group, I would say, call it three-fifths of the state, that are going to feel like if we don't do it this year, we are shirking our duties because the report makes it clear that the current formula is inequitable. So we're all going to have to vote our, our perception of which of those is the worst outcome, right? Is it, is it better to, so it sounds like you'd be okay with a few years before we address it? Yeah, a few years out from, this is soon for me. Sorry, I mentioned legal risk here, which is that court that EDM did is public. It's just a recipe for a lawsuit when it's all written down. So, if you don't, but, yeah. I would say there's a risk, there's a risk that, that Report will be used. If you delay, don't take it for a couple of years or don't take action. Um, I think there's a reasonable chance you're going to get a lawsuit based on that report. I think it's interesting, though, for a lawsuit. I think it's time Brigham's looked at again. I think the way we've defined equal opportunity in the state is wrong and it never got us there. Okay. It's a 30 year old case now or a 20 year old case that, that uh, I think is inherently flawed and we will never be able to come to it. I don't think equal access to educational opportunity has to do with money. As a student at BFA St. Albans who wanted to study economics in college, I couldn't take an economics class, and I, Essex had one. Now, I had a lot of opportunities at BFA St. Albans that I don't feel like I was ever limited, but if that to me is an inherent, oh, that's a constitutional violation. I didn't get that equal opportunity. I, we, you know, it's. I think we're flawed in this building to think that equal opportunity is where dollars are because I don't think dollars necessarily relate to the quality of, of what we're getting product. Um, so, well, I don't think it would be a bad thing 
necessarily if we end up back in the courts to try to figure this one out. And you can never avoid the possibility, right. but it's Jim's job to, to give us advice, and they're much appreciated. I think um, I have gotten letters. I, I mentioned the one from a guy who's talking in terms of reparations. Um, I have gotten you know, a, a sequence of letters where people are making it clear that, that they view, view this study as authoritative and solving the question of whether their districts have been underfunded, usually rural communities. We all have a letter from VREC, I think they're called, 40 some odd um, districts or, um, signed on to that making a similar case. Um, so I, I guess, you know, inherent in what Jim was saying, you were saying there were people at home who needed to be brought up to speed. I, I think that's what I was attempting to do here by having the state board go out. And I talked to Chair Carroll, who would be um, excited was his word to, to do that, to go out and um, try to engage the state on the issue. That's, that's the sort of thing that he envisions the board doing in its new incarnation, and then passing that information to AOE. Um, I think you know Ruth's concern about us having the policy in front of us, I don't worry about that, because this would come immediately to us beginning of January, and then we would we would operate on it as we would with any bill that we deal with. Yeah, I think oh, a couple things. Yeah. Uh, I do think that, that this is an appropriate, based on all the work we just did, it's so riveting about the state board. It's a, I think it's an appropriate use of that, and I think that I like that about this yeah. and having them go out and do the public hearings. I five, maybe too few, because they're not going to get to every place. But um, I like that. What I what I would like to do is expand the implementation group beyond mm -hmm. AOE. I, I have. I think we got testimony from somebody. I, I can't remember if it was Jeff or somebody, Jay, one of the Jay people in this room, um, who said, you know, uh, there were they were concerned about um, making sure we did this right so that we didn't um, degrade um, respect for public education in our mm -hmm. state. And I, I have those concerns, too. I think yep. that we're in a sort of fragile period right now after Act 46 and 173 and proficiency-based learning and all the other things that are causing stress in, mm -hmm. out in the field. And I want to make sure that I think we should do this. Mm -hmm. And even though my districts will not be helped or they will be neither helped nor harmed it seems mm -hmm. in the most for the most part I think it's the right thing to do for education and, and, and finance in the state I just don't want to do it badly and have mm -hmm. it further erode trust in public schools and so that's why I feel like we need to have broader broader representation in the and creating an implementation plan and there are policy decisions that need to be made before you get to the part of the plan where like how, what do you do with with these things? The other thing that's not mentioned and that is is you know we the reason I requested that we update to 2020 numbers is because of the interactions with merged schools versus non-merged schools and that has a big effect on the school poverty rates and how they're calculated for school districts and sparsity and probably maybe to a lesser degree ELL but certainly poverty rates and sparsity and. Um, I wouldn't want the, the outcome of this to be punishing schools that went ahead and merged through Act 46. Because well, then if they hadn't merged, they would have had a higher poverty level, they would have had a higher sparsity level, and now they're merged into one right, district. That's so not, that's the not interaction, punishing them. But being, being conscious of those interactions and how that will play out in the field and how that may exacerbate some of the. Right, but you could as easily say. Um, so, in other words, they merged. The reality now is that they partake of economies of scale that are allowing them lots of advantages. So you'd be saying, allow them all those advantages, but then should we? No, I'm not saying we do that. I'm okay. saying we have to be sensitive to that in the field 
there is there is huge division yeah. in my county right now yeah. about school districts that have merged and they're, they're, the schools are now pitting against each other, the communities are. And this, and getting this out there to say, oh, well, if we hadn't merged, we would have this big bump in our pay with this. There's going to be these interactions in the, you know, in the field about all of these various policies piling on top of each other. I don't think it's a reason not to do this, yeah. but I think it's a reason to do this very carefully and thoughtfully. And I have concerns that the AOE and the State yeah. Board of Education will be able to do that. How, how would you feel about if the language was that they shall create an implementation plan drawing on the advice and study of listed parties, comma, blah, blah, blah? Um, I like that better. It would um, make it explicit that they should be interacting with them. What I want to get away from is a situation where we create a committee yeah. where AOE is one vote, Jeff Francis is one vote, blah, blah, blah. You're nothing against Jeff Francis, by the way. <laughs> He's not in the room. Just, just saying that. <laughs> what, what you wind up in that case is going back to square one, half the people in the room maybe. Um, you know, based on their constituencies, not not excited about doing it. I think if we want to, if we want to um, move forward from the study and be careful, we can hand the authority to AOE, and then we're giving um, the state board not the authority, but we're assigning them the the duty of going out and taking public opinion, passing that to AOE, who retains the authority. So they're. Together, they're putting together um, the raw materials for the plan, but they would draw on these other people um, and organizations, but without being inhibited by them. Because, you know, the administration supports this. They support redoing the waiting formula, even though it's politically sensitive. And I think that's that's a value to us if we want to go forward. So. Um, I'm, I'm hesitant to say, well, I just don't trust the agency involved. Um, I think we can, we can trust that no matter what happens, it's coming back to us. Um, and hopefully they produce something that looks really pretty good for us and then we can. And, and I do think legislators can enter the process at any point, going to the meetings, um, interacting with the state board, going directly to the agency and expressing concerns or ideas. Um, I like that better than, than study committee two. Yeah, I agree. We don't need study committee two. Okay. I, I do agree with that. I, I was I was thinking more implementation working group, which may be just semantics. I, I, yeah. I have realized that. But to say we are going to do this and we want mm -hmm. you to tell us yeah. how you think we should do it. That's what I want to do. But I think having a broader Mm -hmm. entity doing that than just AOE with the public outreach efforts of the State Board of Education. So maybe in consultation with is a good compromise. Yeah. Um, and if you want to develop a list yeah. of parties that make sense to you um, and pass it to Jim, he can drop it in this draft. Okay. And I, we are still doing that public hearing? Yes. yes. On the 11th. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we're not going to pass this until after that public hearing? Is that correct? Yeah, so, so the idea would be not to act on any language until we've heard from them. Okay, that would be great. I would, yeah. I would like that. And we'll, you know, we'll take a look at this two or three more times, well, at least once more before the public hearing. So um, any thoughts from anybody else? Yeah, I agree, I agree that um, uh, naming bigger groups to consult with makes Makes okay. sense. I mean, theoretically, I like. I, I think it ought to just be the agent's job. <laughs> Given the track record, it's yeah. probably yeah. wise. And and you know, it'll make explicit what they would probably do anyway, but it'll make sure yeah. they do. And okay, does that make sense, Jim? And, and I just wanted to say, you know, that some districts will actually fare better. I mean, everybody realizes that, right? I mean, there's, yeah. Oh, yeah, I mean, yeah. you know. <laughs> oh, yeah, talk so, to yeah, Bobby. He's very better, yeah, better by two here. pennies to the cost of 52 and some other towns. I mean, well. you guys both have districts that are both fixed. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. going to be a big, and I, we've already, well, I've already heard from 
Yeah. So the ones that are not too heavy about Burlington and yeah, it's we're not so even into the better than they are. So. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so if you want to update this, and, and then when uh, on Tuesday we'll be at Wadooski. That's Tuesday when we come back. Right, yeah. So um, we won't pick it up then, but on Wednesday, of course, we'll pick it up. And then on that Wednesday, assuming that we don't hear anything from AOE or the state board, we'll vote out um, the state board bill. Sure. And then tomorrow, we're going to do, what did you say we were going to do, Jane? Um, TBA. <laughs> Go home. TBA, it says. No, that's, oh, tomorrow? TBA. Tomorrow. Oh, TBA. <laughs> what did you say? TBA absent. <laughs> Friday. Oh, uh, we're doing. 166. So we're not going to do that tomorrow because we're going to hold that over until Wednesday. Okay. So we'll do the miscellaneous bill tomorrow. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we'll do the miscellaneous bill. We'll, we'll talk about athlete um, deal. The other piece. Oh, yeah, the, the UVM language. We were going to. Um, so, were you in the room, Jim, when we talked about expanding that UVM language? Uh, I was here. <coughs> uh, that language, you had that draft by somebody, but it wasn't me. That language that you brought. Oh, no, it no. was Stephanie. Stephanie, yeah. Yeah. did you get a copy? Um, somewhere, I think it's a service. Let me, let me give you a copy, and then we have two suggestions, as I remember. This is oh, yeah. the miscellaneous bill. This is the uh, We already voted that out. So it'll be the 224. 224. So let me just find that, Jim, and then. Are we going to do proficiency base? Tomorrow. Oh, there's AOEs, I think, here. <laughs> I think we're oh, here. Because yeah. they said that, yeah. Emily said they already on, got on the bus, yeah, so we need to talk. Okay. Oh, I took it the other way. I oh, thought oh. you were already on the bus and weren't going to be here, but you were already on the bus to come over to here. come here. Yes. So please. Yeah. Um, uh, your path is in it? Yes, I have. Okay. Yeah, and please join us. Was... I, I, I think you can here. I misunderstood Emily to, to say that's okay. I thought all made mistakes. I had gotten on the bus to go home. Okay. So the reason why we asked you to come in and thank you for coming mm -hmm. is that we were wondering what was going on with the agency. Was there an action plan, something as a practice is being assembled, some plan to um, target districts that were having trouble with PBL. Um, so if you could fill us in on what the actual administrative approach is, and then the question is, how can we help um, without hurting what either local communities are doing that's working or what you already have in the process? So thank you very much for this opportunity to talk about proficiency-based learning. I've had this since I'm the team lead for the proficiency-based learning team, which is the team that has all the content specialists, two of whom have only been there for their still their six-month probationary period. And we have just hired a new parts person who's moving here from Tennessee. So we're bringing some people into the state, at least two. So we're excited about that, just so you have a little bit of background information. And I, I think yesterday um, you were talking. I'm going to put myself yeah. on the record. I'm Jessica Carlos. I'm the division director of which the PBL team sits. There's six other teams. Okay. Um, that, I think there was some misunderstanding. Susan Yasaloni was here, and when she was asked about an action plan, might not have understood what you were actually asking about okay. because the proficiency based learning team, we have a two year work plan that includes um, support for proficiency based learning. Um, we have people like Maggie Carrera Bly, who's very invested in the state science assessment. My team has been doing a lot of work for the alternate assessments. 
So proficiency-based learning is a part of every team member's work, but they also have content expertise and responsibilities related to that content. So in terms of, it, it might be good. Yeah, so again, I guess I just pause because I think I appreciate that you asked that question. and. and mm -hmm. um, I do suspect that perhaps Susan was cut off. <coughs> so we have a, a, a broader set of goals for, for the agency. We have priority actions for the division. There's six teams that sit within the division. Obviously, proficiency is actually a goal, which is that you want every student to minimally be proficient. And I think one has to ask themselves the question, what would be the alternative if we don't want kids to minimally be proficient? Um, but it's within a larger ecosystem. So it came with multi-tiered systems of support and personalization and flexible pathways. Granted, some of those things were statutorily defined, others were regulation, and some came with funds and some came without funds. But within that context, there is a set of team goals, but those are always also attached to teams across the agency and across the division, because to stand things up, they can't be parsed out. Um, and so I, I think one of the things is uh, she was uh, reflecting on the fact that we've just put out a survey and we're collating the data now. In 2017, we put out a survey as what was the status of PBGRs across all SUs, SDs. We've just collected that information for 2020, and I think that's what she was reacting to when she said uh, we're collecting data. And we always use data to inform what will be the next set of two to three year goals that we're putting out in the field. Mm -hmm. So to give you some ideas about the professional, professional learning opportunities that we've provided, based on integrated field uh, reviews, the data from those reviews, we noticed that um, systems with good intent were trying to create local comprehensive assessment systems, but the assessment systems really were focused on elementary and in math and English language arts. And according to the education quality standards, a local comprehensive assessment system should incorporate all content areas grades K through 12. So based on those data, we've been providing convenings around um, what is a strong proficiency, what is a strong local comprehensive assessment system. And within a proficiency-based system, we think really think that performance assessments are essential, that you can't assess those transferable skills without giving students opportunities to do something. So our second convening was um, directly focused on performance assessments, going over some resource sources that we had developed in terms of quality criteria for performance assessments, sharing that information with people from the field and help and getting them to help us improve that work. Because whenever we do something and then we get input from the field, it, they always make it better. And, and um, they're using the material, so they have a really good idea about what will work in their systems, what will not work. The other thing we do with the resources that we create is that we put them on our website as a Word document so that people can tailor them for their specific <coughs> circumstances. So can I just ask, when yeah. you say a convening, mm -hmm. what, what, in physical terms, what is a convening? Convening, for me, is that idea of pulling people together to make some decisions and problem solve together. And how around. I'm just wondering, who, who, who's pulled together where, how often? Our, our focus was really educational leaders, so curriculum directors, um, principals, teacher leaders are the, are the, are the um, roles that are most often represented. That we're trying to think systemically. I love working with teachers, however, a teacher only has one classroom. If I can work with a curriculum director who is working with a supervisory union or district, I have the opportunity to affect a lot more educators and therefore students. And, and so, you pick a location and invite everybody and have a morning? Or? Yeah, so we have multiple types of professional learning. I'm sure you've heard folks come in and talk about network improvement communities. We can perform workshops, there's conferences, there's convenings. Generally, convenings are when we're developing resources for folks and you want to be informed to make sure that what you're developing is of most use to them, mm -hmm. the problems that they're trying to solve, and I think you'll see that in the resources. We've organized under headers and provided links so that you can go and take a look at some of those samples. Usually it's the stakeholders who are most impacted, and there often can be multiple stakeholders. So sometimes you might specify, we want a, a team. So we want someone who is in leadership, someone who is maybe 
uh, district leadership, building leadership, and then the classroom educator. Sometimes we're focusing on special educators because we're doing something very specific about ensuring that all students can meet proficiency. Sometimes it's folks who are responsible for flexible pathways, but one of the trickiest pieces is how do you align flexible pathways to the proficiency-based graduation <coughs> requirements of a particular school, and so you pull folks together. Generally, on average, we can have, we can have our technical assistance be informed by 100 to 300 to 800 educators at any one time, depending on how long we can sustain the project. Um, sometimes we use contractors to uh, identify spaces. It makes it a little bit easier to get locations. Sometimes we work with schools. Uh, we have leagues, so like the League of Innovative Schools, there's 25 high schools who are involved. We actually often have our conferences or convenings at those sites around the state, so that usually it's north south, or sometimes if we can have four regions covered. Um, but it, it varies depending on whatever the activity is. Okay. The, the third convening actually was the most interesting one for me um, because it, it's new work um, in terms of how do we help students design performance assessments. So if a student is doing a flexible pathway, how do we help them figure out what evidence they're going to collect to demonstrate that they've actually met proficiencies? Excuse me. Okay. I'm sorry. Please continue. Right. Um, and the other thing we do, like we've worked really hard to put this information together, so I look for multiple ways to disseminate it. That I'm currently writing some blogs that will include kind of the stories of those convenings, along with links to all of the resources. We are doing workshops in other, at other conferences related to local comprehensive assessment systems, and we'll be at the Best Institute Week Long Institute once again sharing with educators who haven't participated previously information about assessment systems because we feel that there are real levers of change that um, I was a science person in theory and um, it was always interesting for me to watch teachers and what causes them to really change um, and it was when we had performance assessments in science great level performance assessments and we'd get together with the student work and there would be um, some variation in terms of what students produce and the opportunities for teachers to talk to one another about, you know, just how did you manage to make that happen in, in my in your classroom? Yeah, she is. <laughs> uh, but that's when I saw teachers, um, because I wasn't always welcome into all classrooms, but once we started doing performance assessments, all teachers want their students to be successful. But that's when I got invited into classrooms where teachers were kind of struggling with science, science with yes, teaching science. So. Um, yeah, so performance assessments, uh, I, I think, and assessment in general, because assessment drives what happens in classrooms, is really important. So based on the IFR data, as well as the going back to the important lever of change, um, that is why we've been providing those opportunities throughout the state. And that's just one example of some of the work that we're doing. So I have a question. I, <clears throat> one of the school districts I, I represent probably what I can put together have some of the poorest implementation in the state. Um, and they they made it very, or tried to make it clear to, to the parents that um, AOE was providing them no support. So yeah. You know, how, how, do you, yeah. how do we answer to that? Are you guys actively reaching out or are they coming yeah. in? You know, how's the relationship working? Are you guys looking for places where you can go and say, hey, it's not working, we're, we need, here's this, or... Um, are you just waiting for them to call you and raise their hand when things are going on? Well? So, so there's a mix of things. So one, the first thing we did is we actually did an audit to see how many folks from St. Albans actually participated in any of the professional learning that we've offered over the last couple of years. I believe there was one person who was not at a district or leadership level. So, uh, and, and I think that that's important for folks to know. No, no, and I, we, I agree. I don't want to place blame on you if it's no, not No, because I, you know, we, we love bogey maps. I mean, it's a great way to um, not take responsibility. I think the agency should sit here and say, certainly we have some responsibility in this, but I would also say that what we've tried to organize, and this is not the full complement of what we provided, is uh, organizing both professional learning that's been provided, the technical assistance that's currently sitting on our website and that's out there, that often what we try to do is make sure that those things are tethered together or tailored to the audience and then direct them to it. One thing that we are currently working on from a structural perspective is we're rebooting our professional learning network. It had been a system that had been put in place and we had contracted out with some funds that we had 
um, identified within the agency uh, to have certain professionals from well-known organizations to provide various series, particularly around proficiency-based learning and personalized learning. Um, however, I think it was not effective in getting the word out. So one thing that we would own is we want to improve how people hear about the opportunities. We often have listservs, so every um, education coordinator at the agency who's responsible for a program usually has a fairly lengthy listserv, um, mostly because also people don't get off the listserv, so it can be thousands of people. Um, so we usually send it out through that. We have our weekly field memo. Um, we certainly reach out to some of the professional organizations that have actually been named. We coordinate with them all the time. We work with them uh, around the proficiency-based learning symposium that was recently offered, um, and, and we certainly provided some support there. But one thing that we'd like to do is we have a digital platform, and as you know, the state is actually overhauling its entire web pages, which also these are all the things that are hard to quantify and articulate to people where you can have delays. Um, but we're, we're turning over our professional learning network so that we actually have a coding and tagging system so people can put in and search for professional learning based on something that they're interested in, and then also download reports, and that's a way that we can communicate. It will also auto-populate a calendar. So we're, we're working on that, but of course we have three communications people, one whom you see every day here, which means that he's not doing communications. So I'm actually working on that, right? But I have six teams and I'm responsible for 15 independent grants and et cetera and 22 contracts. And you know, so you're, you're doing all of this. And I think one of the things is that the sheer volume of what people are contending with. It's absolutely true that our public education system certainly should be honored, should be respected. There has been a distinct lack of civility in the conversation around education in the state. The fact that literally I'm interviewing principals who are coming to the agency to work, and I always ask this question to folks, why the agency, why do you want to do state level work? And to literally have folks say, well, it came down to I could either be a really good principal or I could be a good spouse and parent. And it's now time that I have to be a good spouse and parent because literally it's just eating me alive to be out there trying to talk about this, which is why I want to go back to that question. What is the alternative to proficiency? Kindergarten, primary education has always been a proficiency-based system. Can you imagine if we promoted kids who had not received basic numeracy or literacy? Right? You don't just say, well, good kid shows up, puts his lunchbox away, you know, C plus, move him along. Right? You hold him. We, we actually had multi-age Grades, right? We have classrooms in which you're doing K to two or one and two. We, we do that because we know that we need folks to have the requisite skills. The problem is that we have turned it into something more com complicated than it needs to be. And really, I want to ask that this body be a champion in articulating that minimally we should say that if someone, however we grade them, however we re report their learning, a B plus actually means that someone knows, understands, and can do independently in novel situations. We are at a time right now in which we cannot anticipate the future. Maybe you know four decades ago or 10 years ago, we could say this is what the next 10 years are going to be. We can't, right? I mean, there's cars that you download a $3,000 app right, to update your car. What? You know, and it's self-driving. What's next? So you need to have kids who literally absolutely know it. I think, was it last week or a couple weeks ago, you asked the question, well, I got a good education, you know? So why do we have to do this? That's, that's not incompatible. It's very likely that you had teachers who were absolutely committed to making sure that how they reported how you were doing was an accurate representation of what you were doing and that they weren't going to let you graduate without minimally being proficient. Proficiency-based systems are also really good for kids who want to excel because now there's no longer a boundary. In a traditional system, if you imagine just a circle, you have kids who got pushed out and then couldn't get back in. So we developed a high school completion program and flexible pathways, and we have adult education, and that's all the money going out. And then we have kids who are hitting a ceiling because there's nowhere to go, because there's no extended learning. There's no way to advance. There's no way to extend their learning uh, to exceed proficiency. In a proficiency-based system, you just erase that boundary. Now, folks have been pushed out. They can come back in because we're saying we're going to make sure that you, you know, understand, and can do. And for the kids who want to excel, we have early college. We have dual enrollment. They can design their own learning. They can negotiate curriculum. They can do all of these things. The problem is, is that this kind of change, if for 100 years, we've been doing something the same way the whole time. It's not going to change in four years or six years. I mean, the, the, the regulation was put in place, what, in 2014? 
which means that we're starting to roll out, and by the way, there's no funds, so that means the agency has to go after grant funds so that they can pay contractors to provide professional learning. So there's a year, right? Plus, you've got PLPs, flexible pathways, plus now we start to add in Act 46 and all of these things. It's just on top, on top, on top until the skeleton can't move, right? Understood. Let's let's just <laughs> stop there. She's on a roll. Um, uh, what, what I would say. Mountain, tempest what, and teacup. What what I would um, say is that I I think the committee, from the testimony we've taken, um, has a, a generally positive outlook on proficiency based learning, but as Senator Parent pointed out uneven results in certain districts that's driving anxieties and so what I would what I would ask you is is this um, what I hear you saying is you have a plan you've developed resources which are available digitally or on your website is there um, because we also go out and feel and and that's my question is yeah. there a um, given the the severity of some of the problems in some of the districts. Are you proactively going out to those districts to offer them help of one sort or another? We are, but we also have to balance it with folks, again, viewing, are you coming in to evaluate, right? So we have our account accountability system. So education quality reviews, the integrated field reviews, is another data point. We instituted listening tours, so the first two years I was at the agency, we went out to schools. Of course, those schools, if, if they were interested, someone could say no. We then visited the second year after do, engaging in collaborative problem solving to say, how can we work you through? We've done the same thing. We have an implementation kit that we've just launched. We've gone out. We were just up in North Country can City. You, can you just explain that? The implementation kit is yeah. actually for flexible pathways, but it, it has everything to do with proficiency, which is how is it that we're measuring student learning? Right? How is it that we're articulating to families and communities so they're making informed decisions before they engage in a learning activity? There's also a student tool that goes with it. There are two facilitation guides. We went up, we're evaluating things that aren't even flexible pathways, but we're going up to sit with teams to say, how can we help? But if you're asking the question, what if someone does not want us to come and we're not engaging in monitoring or we're not engaging in a formal field review or education quality review, do we have the authority to say, no, we insist, right? So what we have to do is we have to develop those relationships, mm -hmm. which we do. We belong to a million organizations. You're out there. You're saying, please let me come. But we, you understand that people might feel sensitive. So you have to almost play the long game where you're saying, I promise you we're not coming here to evaluate or judge. But we are coming to help you. But at some point, there is a responsibility at the local level, right? We wouldn't have local control if the expectation was that it wasn't implemented at the local level. So it's a it's a balance. Uh, but I would say that we're continuing to do those those field visits, that outreach to say we'll come, we go to those professional organizations where they can bring together their members and then offer. So the VSA has a conference, BPA has a conference, BSBA, VICLA, etc. Have you had any school districts tell you and not? terms but basically you're not welcome uh, not to me directly um, but I will say that uh, certainly you know we hire administrators. it's not I mean I was in the field so uh, certainly I have heard people say well you know it's not like there's AOE police you know but I mean I think this is the thing is when we talk about lag and drag on a system it's it's because we are subject to constant change and I would just ask that we stay the course because you know that folks are out there just waiting to see if we lose our will and our knees tremble and we go back, right? Well, and that's another question I had. So stay the course. Um, Proficiency-based learning, as the Secretary has said many times, is different things for different communities. And he has said, we're not going to be policing what you do. So what does stay the course really mean then? If there's, if there's not an agreed upon course or a single course, um, are you just saying that we should not um, insert ourselves in the process? Because the, the course is really 300 different courses playing out. Um, yeah, I mean, to, to some degree. I mean, I, I think that 
we are moving towards consistency. I think last year when we came in, um, if, if you remember, it would be understandable. If you don't, you know, we invited Andrew Jones in, who you heard from again this year, because we, we work with folks as they develop solutions to scale those solutions, to share those out with folks who are looking for those solutions. People are at different places. I mean, we just heard folks talking about how different areas are resourced differently. And so we know we have different learning management systems and different student information systems. Well, that's how people measure and report grades, right? So again, if we were to change things up, they can negotiate different contracts. If they want to customize, that costs different money. So I think there's a whole slew of things that we have to consider. If I was to be so bold as to interpret what the secretary was saying, I think he's saying that there, there is no one mandate coming from the state as to how you implement proficiency-based learning, but there are a set of recommended practices that are based in evidence-based research, which I know previously you've been asking about, learning targets, measurement of learning, and I believe when the exercise happened, uh, John asked you to say, what would you need in a proficiency-based system? I heard clear learning goals, so that's learning targets. That makes it explicit. High quality, well, that's measurement of learning based on mastery instructional approaches and support, <coughs> pacing and progression. I heard someone say an individualized pace. When and where learning takes place, that's flexible pathways and assessment of learning. Those are six components that have an evidence base that comprise how you get to proficiency. And so see, um, AAR, American Institutes for Research, has created a teacher and student survey based on those six key characteristics. Mm -hmm. um, Sigrid Olson and I were trained in it. Um, it's been too busy this year, really. People, we've asked a lot of them. But this summer, we plan on doing a training for educational leaders so that they could use this, these surveys in their systems mm -hmm. to figure out what are their strengths and what are areas they might want to target to improve. The other thing um, that is really in interesting, I think, and indicates um, the variety around the state in terms of implementation, we just did a survey and we received 100% um, information from 100% of our high schools around the status of um, proficiency-based graduation requirements and personalized learning plans. And currently there's a range from six graduation requirements to 135. Mm -hmm. That's an indicator that we need to do some work, work at least regionally with folks. Um, and, and the tool that we have to use now as a lens to consider what your graduation requirements are, and that's different than what we want all students to know, understand, and be able to do. This is what they need to graduate. But <coughs> we've worked with over 300 educators, business folks, students gave us the best input. Um, um, who else? Every group we could, could manage, parents, community members, to create a, a, a Vermont portrait of a graduate. And it has six attributes. Under those attributes, we have descriptors and then performance indicators. It looks very different than the original one that the agency created. It was kind of our transferable skills. The transferable skills are woven throughout it. But my favorite one is well-being. And that came from students. And it's only one of six. It's not the only one. It's one of six attributes. And within that, they wanted financial literacy, which I also thought was interesting. So other things like um, academic proficiency, learner agency are some of the examples. So we can now use that portrait of a graduate to say, here's, here's the goal. Because if teachers can't hit something if they don't know what they're aiming for, here's the goal, here are the attributes. Do our graduation requirements actually enable students to meet this vision of a graduate? Mm -hmm. um, so another question just uh, to cut to the chase. We're trying to decide if we should do something, nothing, or some mildly helpful thing in between. Um, so is there anything that we could that we could do by way of legislative action that would be helpful to what the agency is doing? For instance, is, is a lack of resources driving the plan rather than what ideally the plan would be? A couple of years ago, we, we got a Nellie May, um, some funding from Nellie May, to do the kickoff for the portrait of a graduate, as well as the um, grading re research brief for grading practices. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it was really helpful to be able to bring in a national expert that national they like us, like the field, I think, likes us. Mm -hmm. And I think we have something to contribute, but the people who have a national expert, ex have national expertise um, and that perspective really bring people to the table. So having some funding where we could have, 
have money for larger convenings um, and bring in national experts, I think would be wonderful. Um, we, we've kind of, in our testimony, we've kind of isolated the, the, not surprisingly, the notation as the piece that tends to be driving the most, mm -hmm. you know, contention, anxiety, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, would it be possible to arrange a series of convenings on that piece? Yeah, and, and it sort of, sort of began with the PBL symposium that happened on the 11th, um, and hoping to be able to provide for folks different exemplars based on the different systems that they're using. Right, they're not all created the same. So, power school, but then if you can afford to actually modify power school so that you can get what you need. Mm -hmm. um, so certainly, those kinds of convenings. I, I think there would be two things. One is that you know there's a, one appropriation for secondary school reform. Um, it's $200,000 when it was first laid out, it was for implementation of Act 77, right? So literally there's been no financial support and those are grants that go out to the field. Mm -hmm. And I think that if you have systems right now who are attempting to either develop, refine, or expand upon how they, their reporting systems, how they actually articulate these things, how they take 130 PBGRs and get it down to something that's a little bit mm -hmm. more manageable and realistic, they have to rely on the few in-service days, the few early release days, and that means that usually they're looking to be able to pay their staff to stay to be able to do that work, that additional work. So I think being able to provide funding to the field to, to really get over the hump and do that work is really important. I do also agree that you know the agency having the opportunity to hold those convenings, to put that work out there, mm -hmm. to facilitate it. We're using a lot of our leagues and networks to do that. The New England Secondary School Consortium, the League of Enabled Schools, those tend to be centered on secondary schools. Inclusive of middle school, but generally secondary schools. And really what we're looking at is PK, PK to 12 systems, or whatever, how are those systems are organized. Because I think we also heard that if you want to have coordination of curriculum, mm -hmm. a clear pathway, not disjointed, different sending schools, sending to one district high school, all of them have different pathways, different standards, kids are entering the door at different places. If you want that coordination of curriculum, you have to be able to convene and put out their system-wide supports. Um, I don't know if you uh, feel comfortable doing this, but if you would like to generate language, um, for an appropriations section of our miscellaneous bill that would encapsulate what you just said. Um, I have to take your, try to pass on my understanding of what you should to Jim because it'll be a game of telephone and won't mean much by the time it gets to him. But if you would send me language uh, via Genie, um, we can take a look at it. I, I think it would be great to the extent that it's centered around the PBGR, um, uh, you know, development and evolution and in-service professional development around that piece, that's very targeted because that does speak to, uh, I think it's fair to say that that's what we isolated as the, the biggest issue for people. And the transcripts. Um, right. Yeah, we yeah. had some students from um, the think tank at CBU come talk at the agency mm -hmm. a couple years ago, and one student said, um, "With all the changes in technology, how come our transcripts look pretty much the same as they did 30 years ago?" Mm -hmm. And the Mastery Transcript Consortium is doing some really interesting work in terms of creating a, an electronic platform where you get a quick view of the student, and then you can dig in deeper to find out more. So that admissions officers can you know, do that quick scan that they need to do, yeah. but then get additional information. There are, I think, six schools that are piloting it this year. And what, what's interesting about this group is they called every every um, student who applied for college, they called the admissions officers to check with them what worked with this transcript, what did not work, and they're constantly trying to revise it and improve it so that it is a platform that works for a variety of colleges. And they're going after some of the big universities and having those conversations with them because if they can make those bigger universities comfortable, they're thinking some of the other colleges will fall behind. I believe they're having a meeting this spring with some of the principals and educators in Vermont to talk to them to find out more about what, yeah. what they need. Yeah, I mean, essentially what you described is a, is a hybrid model where you can get mm -hmm. the old traditional grades, but you can also get a, a richer portrait. Um, yeah, that's, that's really the, 
the key is how, how to help districts that didn't make the right call on how to present grades mm -hmm. and have. And I don't know how funding plays into that. I, I haven't checked into what the cost is, and I don't know it's, mm -hmm. if it's too expensive for some, some systems or not. But and I, something yeah, but I, I think another focus at the agency right now is also providing assistance to districts so that they know how to actually expend some of their federal dollars. Mm -hmm. I, I believe you've probably heard from the secretary that we, we tend, have a tendency to send a lot of those federal monies back. Mm -hmm. So by being able to provide really specific guidance about here's the evidence base, this is where it might fit within your title dollars. This is how you can do it. We, we've been piloting with like different um, courses, like EMC Squared, which has been in collaboration with VSC and um, VSEC. You know, though we were about to send out a memo to say this is how you can support professional learning for your teachers, so that they can be trained to deliver that high quality uh, mathematical instruction that's going to lead to proficiency. So I think the more that we can do that, they'll have. Because I, I do think that there's some value in saying that it's not always about funds. But it's about, you know, there's different kinds of resources, investments, time, support, beyond just financial supports. So yeah, I heard you just say that you're sending federal dollars back that are going unused. And, and yeah, we're talking about a new state appropriation. Is, is this, if you can use those federal dollars better and, and put them toward yeah, the so state some of them appropriation? Yes, so some are like IDA. So all federal dollars often have very significant and specific restrictions on how they can be used. Mm -hmm. Also, if we have already funded at the state level, so as an example, dual enrollment, it gets really hard to then say we need federal dollars to do it because we're getting into supplanting versus su supplementing. But I think in looking at some of those infrastructural pieces that people might- The other thing that, that I heard that concerned me, mm -hmm. the two other things that I heard that concerned mm -hmm. me beyond the sort of notation issue, which I think we all agreed was problematic um, was um, this question of collecting data so that in future years we can have some data that shows that yeah, this yeah, was yeah. useful. I, I remember that, uh, that question. You clearly really listened to the tapes of us talking. No, I was in the room. I, we're, oh, I'm sorry. I like to be very undercover. <laughs> yeah. uh, so I would just say that one, um, which I, I think, you know, uh, you were talking to Mike Martin and you're talking to John Painter and you're talking to Andrew and Gabe, uh, they were struggling to figure out how they would assess what we would assess the way that we've been assessing all along. We would build into the existing accountability system. And I think last year I came and I read to you from our common data project and part of the New England Secondary School Consortium that uh, as of the 2017 data, which is always a couple years behind because you're talking about cohorts, is that we're leading the New England states when it comes to both four and six year graduation rates, college persistence rates or completion rates, high school graduation rates, even across certain groups. And what we would be doing is looking at those same metrics. That's the concern, right? If we want to reduce the dropout rate, which we have since 2013 by 1.5%, if we want to increase college persistence rates, but also around those historically marginalized groups, we would be looking at those same things. So we'd be using our accountability system. We would be leveraging that. We wouldn't create another inefficiency by having another set of measures. OK. I mean, the question originally came up, and I don't know if you were in the hearing with um the Education Commission of the States, and I asked them about national I was not, data. I was not there for that. They were like, oh, yeah, that does not exist. It was wholly unsatisfying. Yes. But my other <laughs> my other question was, and you, you mentioned this in your comments, but for students who are at or exceeds proficiency, we did get testimony from students themselves saying yeah. that you know they felt like it was just, oh, you're proficient, and that's good enough. Yeah. And so I'm wondering if you have any professional development or resources for educators for those specific students who may be already at that level that yeah. they can then help those students to exceed proficiency yeah. and go beyond yeah. what is this. So absolutely, and I would say, again, that professional development isn't necessarily going to look different for anyone else because you're going to be given to those six fundamentals of how do you implement a high-quality proficiency-based system. You know, I hate to say it, and I hate to say it on record, but... Uh, across all jobs and careers, you can have folks who aren't necessarily excelling, right? Uh, so I'm not sure if it's proficiency that resulted in someone saying good enough, right? How do we know that that's someone who wasn't saying good enough prior to us implementing proficiency? That is absolutely fair. So what we, what we really want to do is be making sure that we are investing and continuing to build out our education quality reviews and our accountability systems and providing support to district and building leaders who are the folks who are 
you know, responsible for evaluating teachers and making sure that based on those evaluations, they're using CIP funds to invest in needs-based professional learning to make sure that those teachers are getting what they need so that they can give students what they need. But certainly we, as an example, would be the Flexible Pathways Implementation Kit, again, which is what we've been doing is letting kids engage in flexible pathways, but we're not actually attending to how is that leading to proficiency. How is that expanding upon and providing that extended learning opportunity? So, but I, but I providing think the whole and, and tools like that for them to create profiles and to think that through and to put an action plan in to say, if I can't say yes to this question, how am I going to get to yes? But I think just that that statement alone of how is this leading to proficiency is what bugged a lot of the students. They want to, mm -hmm. how is this leading to excellence? Mm -hmm. And what the students are hearing when they're hearing proficiency based learning is that proficiency is enough, that we're not expecting them to go beyond that. Yeah. So I think a lot of it is about the messaging, and I'm hearing it in the way that you're both talking about it. It's about proficiency, it's not about excellence. Well, and proficient, that's really... Proficient oh. really means, um, does, it's not perfectly synonymous with excellence, but proficient means like very good at something. Yeah, um, it's not creating a balance. But if yeah, yeah. In your annual job review, if you had yeah. not meeting expectations, proficient, and then exceeding expectations, well, if it's yeah, kind of like meeting expectations, yeah. it's like mm -hmm. maybe. I, that's I, what we want for all children. We want all children to be proficient, but we want anyone who can to excel. And that's why when we creating the scoring, when we created the scoring criteria for transferable skills, in that exceeding column, we had a description or. <laughs> putting something like what the student comes up with. They might come up with something we never thought of. So it's actually on the student's plate, not the teacher, to say, I have a great idea and I want to try this. I want to go above and beyond. And if that's not happening in classrooms, that's a problem with instructional practices, mm -hmm. not with proficiency-based learning. So we have to be careful about what when is proficiency-based learning at fault and when are some of the instructional practices not allowing students to accept it. <laughs> I think I take your point because, quite frankly, within our division, we actually refer to this as student-centered learning. And proficiency progressions are just one component of student-centered learning. Flexible pathways, learner profiles, high-quality assessment, student agency, all of that goes into it, which allows for that. And if you want someone to be agentic, to be able to think independently, apply their learning in novel situations, they minimally have to be proficient. But if we don't actually evaluate for proficiency and have some clear target for that, then how do we even know if they're exceeding it? And I'm not sure if that's always clear to students either. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I, th I think for them, what I heard from the yeah. students and from kids that I yeah, know. Yeah, there was a student who ended yeah. up going to CTE, so he was saying he had a 3.8 or 2.8, and he thought he was below, but he was a freshman. And if it was 2.8 as a scale to proficiency-based graduation requirements, that means that he was pretty far along as a freshman. And then as a sophomore, he went to CTE, which, by the way, is an example of student-centered learning, where you can go to CTE, which has historically been proficiency-based. And then he came back and he was 3.8, I think he said. So literally by sophomore year, he was already meeting proficiency-based graduation requirements. But no one was able to explain that to him. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the problem. And actually, in the Presidential Scholar applications, there were some examples of students who use proficiency-based learning as a springboard board to do the work that they wanted to do, Yeah, which was really interesting to read. And we could share some of that with you, if that would be. Well, I really appreciate the, the, uh, the time as I say, if, if you wouldn't mind um, generating language for us that we could, um, you know, massage into something that we can drop into our bill, um, I think our intention is to, at this point, do as little as possible in the in the mandatory sense and not enter into creating any more requirements for anybody. Um, but. It does seem that money might help in a certain targeted spot um, and might attract people who were otherwise saying, leave us alone, we'll do it on our own. So thank you for coming over. Thank you. Thank it. you so much for this opportunity. Absolutely. And thank you for your support and not not making the field go in a different direction right. because they're working extremely hard. Yeah. yeah. Thank Can you. you do want extra copies or anything? They did, but I'll leave them for okay. it. Well, I mean, just so set. <laughs> you, know, you don't want all of these? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to take them home and feed them in the glass? Yeah. <laughs> okay, committee, we are done for today.